So in this presentation, we're going to be looking at this second part of your specification, which is looking at the traditional concept of God and specifically how the ideas of God being creator, being good, the omni qualities, where they come from in the biblical scripture and some of the shared ideas between Jewish and Christian thought. And this is just a breakdown of the elements that you have to be aware of and the things that they might ask you in the exam. Remember, any language on the specification is something that could appear in an exam question. So within the concept of exploring what it means to say God is a creator, there is much debate as to whether the Jewish texts, so the early Old Testament texts such as Genesis and Psalms and Job, whether they actually show that God was a craftsman or whether he created out of nothing. First of all, we're just going to explore what we mean by craftsman. And so craftsman is the idea that God created out of pre-existing matter. A consequence of this is that God's omnipotence and omniscience is limited because if he created out pre-existing matter, the question is, who put that matter there? If God didn't create it all, and things pre-existed his creation, then does that mean that he's got limited knowledge about what um, creation is about? Very much within the craftsman idea is this use of anthropomorphic imagery. So remember, anthro means human, and morph means to change. So what anthropomorphic imagery is, is where God is given human-like characteristics. And so a craftsman is seen more as, like in the picture on the top right, as like a potter moulding the clay and forming the clay. And we see this term form, the Hebrew word for form, used in some of the earlier Jewish texts. Now the debate is, does the Bible actually present God as more as a craftsman? And then really the idea of him creating out of nothing came about as later church teaching as this idea was being was more favourable. You have to be prepared that in an exam, they could ask you a 25 mark explain essay on the idea of God creating out of nothing. So it's important that you've got more to say than just defining the term. And candidates traditionally have struggled with this type of essay. So I would, in an essay, raise the idea, is it a debate? Is it something that is shown in Genesis and the other Jewish texts? Or is it something that's later Jewish teaching? And I would explore examples of them. Remember in a part A explain question, I'm not evaluating it. I'm not arguing whether it does or not. I'm not coming to a judgment. I'm just explaining that the concept is unclear as to whether it's supported by the Jewish text or whether it's actually just church teaching. So one of the earliest sort of um, church teachings that we have on it comes from St. Augustine of Hippo, who you will recognise from the Augustinian Theodicy. And he says, You did not work as a human craftsman does, making one thing out of something else, your word alone created. And so we can clearly see that St. Augustine is saying that this craftsman idea is wrong. It then doesn't really become a formal teaching of the Christian church until the 13th century in 1215, during the Fourth Lateran Council. And here we have a clear declaration that God created out of nothing and the linking with his omnipotence. So if we look at the latter part of the quotation, we have that they say, who from the beginning of time and by his omnipotent power made from nothing. So clearly the church is saying here that God created out of nothing. And as I said before, this is still a matter of debate as to whether this is supported or not by the early Jewish um, and biblical teachings. Now, although your specification doesn't require you to know in detail the biblical texts, it does require you to be familiar with them. And I think the best kind of essays are those that are able to not necessarily quote from the scripture, but show that familiarity so that you're able to paraphrase and to distinguish between Genesis 1, 2 and 3 because obviously Genesis 1 and 2 as we're going to see are very different in their um, description of creation. So Genesis 1 is the six day creation story with God resting on the seventh. We have 
the idea that God sees what he's made and it's good and we have a very repetitive structure to it. The important part for the craftsman and Kreisjoks Nihilo um, debate is fairly on in the beginning. It says, the spirit of God hovered over the waters. And this is very similar to a Babylonian creation myth around the same time. And it may suggest that there was pre-existing matter which the spirit was hovering over. And what God was doing was controlling the chaotic waters. We also have man and woman being made at the same time and this important element of Genesis 1, 26, where God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Obviously, there's debate as to why it says us in the plural. Later on, Christians would say that this was the Trinity. But again, that's something for another time. It demonstrates very much God's omnipotence as he commands things into existence. So by his word alone, things come into existence. There's less anthropomorphic imagery. He's not forming or crafting in the same way as we see in Genesis 2. And we have this first commandment that God gives them dominion over creation. He tells them to rule over creation and subdue it. Genesis 2, on the other hand, is very different. Creation is in a different order. In Genesis 1, we have everything being created in the stages. And then last of all, we have humans. Here, we have humans... And then we, well, Adam specifically, and then we have animals and plants being um, formed, and then we have Eve. So it's a different order of creation. We have a lot more anthropomorphic imagery. God is planting trees, he's walking, he's forming Adam, he breathes into his nostrils, he forms Eve from Adam's rib. And it's important that this word form, this verb, is the same verb that's used as a potter so again this craftsman um, notion coming through Eve is created as a helper for Adam because after creating animals God is said as not being able to find a suitable helper for Adam so he creates Eve they're then given the commandment to not eat from the tree of knowledge and that's one of God's first commandments to them and then we come to Genesis 3 which is in a similar style to Genesis 2. Many people believe that therefore they're from the same source and a different source to Genesis 1. And this is known as the full narrative. And so this is a significant story to be familiar with because we're going to refer to it again and again in religion and science and in, problem, in the problem of evil. So still we have this anthropomorphic imagery of God walking in the garden. Eve is tempted by a crafty serpent or snake, depending on the um, translation that you read. And so it does raise the question, why is he crafty? Um, after Eve tempts Adam, we then have this idea of them feeling ashamed. They realise they're naked, they want to cover up. And God asks the question, where are you? Which some people have said seems an odd part of the story. Does it question his omniscience? Surely he knows where they are. God then punishes Adam and Eve and these are significant punishments. We're told that the land is going to be difficult to work. He, Adam is now going to have to toil for his food. Eve's going to have pain in childbirth and her husband will rule over her. They're also given this punishment of death. They are told that they will return to the dust they were made from, which many people raise as does this mean that actually humans were intended to be immortal and that they weren't going to die? Or is this just and something we would call an ateological myth? And what an ateological myth is, are myths that, and remember with the term myth, we mean something that isn't historically accurate but still communicates truths. So an ateological myth is one that tries to communicate and understand and tell people about why things are the way they are through the use of story. So maybe Genesis 3 is about explaining why it's hard to work land, why it's hard to farm, why women suffer in childbirth, and why we die. And that maybe this is helping people to understand why the way, why the world is the way it is. <laughs> 
it does raise lots of questions for the problem of evil and it does raise questions about God being good which we will return to. Now, if you've got any kind of um, explain question, they're going to ask you things such as explain how God creates in the Bible, explain how God is shown as involved with his creation, explain how the Bible shows God as a craftsman. The very best answers are those that have familiarity with different biblical quotations. And again, familiarity doesn't mean quoting them off by heart. It means being able to paraphrase them and talk about them. And so I'm just going to talk through some of the key biblical quotations that it helps to be used to. So Job 38 is quite a long, substantial piece. But there are lots of parts in that that raise questions of whether God is seen as this ultimate creator who has power over the whole of creation and maybe created out of nothing or whether one that's more as a craftsman. So we have God here speaking to Job. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Who marked off its dimensions? And so what we have is God communicating to Job. Where were you? No one else was there. I was the one who did it all. And in Psalm 33, we have this emphasis of God being this ultimate, omnipotent creator. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. But then we have some of this anthropomorphic imagery of him gathering the waters, him um, putting things into storehouses. But this, again, then this emphasis of him speaking and things happening. So really you can have, you know, just a couple of quotes that actually can suggest maybe creation out of nothing, but also maybe a craftsman element as well. Most of the quotations and the evidence that we've discussed have been from the Old Testament, and that's what the OT and the New T are in brackets for. Now, John 1 is a New Testament quotation, and here we have an emphasis definitely on God being the only creator and the supreme creator. And I think the last part of this is quite a useful phrase to be familiar with. So he says, Through him all things were made, without him. Nothing was made that has been made. And this is very much suggesting this idea of creation out of nothing. Then if we go back to this Old Testament quote from Isaiah, we have this imagery of him being a potter and God forming things. And so this again reminds us of the use of that verb in Genesis 2, where God is forming. These are quite useful quotations to have to contrast with one another. Now, this other part you have to be able to explore is the goodness of God, how God is shown as being good in the Bible. And there are different elements that you have to be able to discuss. So the big idea of God being good as shown in creation. So we have in Genesis 1, God repeatedly says, and he saw what he made and it was good. And if God especially created out of nothing and creation is good, he must be good as the source of the goodness. And then they might ask you to talk about how God's shown as being good in the way that he's involved with his creation, in the fact that he sets the moral behaviour guidelines. And so if we think about if he had just created the world and then left us to it, would that be good? Or is it actually good that he set his commandments, set his standards by which to live by? And you just need to have some examples for that. So we have the Ten Commandments in Exodus. We have um, in the book of Amos where we see that God is punishing those who oppress the weak and the poor. And so he cares about the less fortunate within a society. We also have him saving the Hebrews from slavery in Exodus we have him teaching through Jesus things about, about loving your neighbour, looking after those who are in need through the parable of the sheep and goat. We have actually through, the, through Jesus, the incarnation of God, this ultimate sacrifice where God is sacrificing himself in order to save and bring um, people, humanity back to God. But also Jesus in his life, he not only teaches about loving others, but he performs miracles to help others as well. So he's actually an example of of love and selfless action towards others. 
And then the other concept that they might ask you about is explain how the Bible shows that God is lawgiver and judge. And I think it's always important to set this into the context of God being good. If God didn't give us laws, then it may show that he's not good because he doesn't care about our behaviour towards one another. But equally, if God didn't judge us and punish us, he also may not be good. Because if we didn't have the concept of justice and people being rewarded and punished, and although it involves punishment and others suffering, isn't that fair? And that's the sort of context to put it in. So where do we see examples of God being lawgiver and judge? Well, we have the commandments in Genesis 1 and 2. We then have God judging and punishing Adam and Eve. We also have the idea of God judging in the parable of the sheep and goat. God is going to divide people into the sheep and the goat. And sheep are those who help others and the goats weren't. And so we have lots of examples that we can discuss about how God is shown as being good through caring about our moral behaviour, through giving us laws and through ultimately upholding justice. Now one of the evaluation questions that you could get in the part B is questioning, is the biblical God good? And so what we can look at is just generally, if God is good then why is there evil and suffering in the world and so you can link to your problem of evil material link back to the fall that it came through um the free actions of adam and eve and augustine and the odyssey etc but also some of the stories in the bible raise questions about the goodness of god some people question is it right that god has favorites so why does he save the hebrews at the expense of killing the firstborns of all of the Egyptians. Now you might argue it was just because they were slaves, but still we have this idea that some people are chosen, some people are favouritised. For example, Noah and his family are saved, but then the entirety of the human race is wiped out in Noah's Ark. And is that fair? Is that something that we might see that a just and loving God would do? Some people feel that the test of Abraham's faith was too much. Why would a good God feel the need to ask a man who has long awaited for a son, a God-given son, Isaac, why would God ask him to sacrifice him? Why would he put him through the sort of the pain and the questioning and the terror of sacrificing your only son? And Richard Dawkins argues that this story, story shows that the biblical God is actually malicious and cruel. And Richard Dawkins also argues that when you look at the biblical God, especially the Old Testament, he gets jealous, he gets angry, he becomes malicious and vengeful. And really is that a a good God? And another question to raise is, does it actually make sense to say that God is good? When we think of the term good, we're thinking of a moral goodness. But if God is above morality because he's the source of everything and the source of morals does it even make sense to say he is good do we actually understand what it means for God to be good and what that term means when applied to him another part b that they might ask you um to consider is the idea is if God created everything is he responsible for it and so again we have this link to the problem of evil and suffering but they will want you to talk more about the idea of him being a creator than just generally going off on um, about the theodicies. So obviously Augustine would say no. He would say it's the fault of Adam and Eve. God created a perfect creation that went wrong because of the three the free actions of moral agents. Irenaeus would say that he's not completely because we bring about suffering through our free actions, but actually... Evil and suffering is part of the creation in order for us to develop and grow. God allows us to make mistakes so that we mature and we develop. But then you can ask the question, if God created out of nothing, creation ex nihilo, then surely he must be responsible. And it kind of links to that criticism of Augustine's The Odyssey of how does a perfect creation go wrong? God must share some responsibility. Maybe creation wasn't perfect. Could it be perfect? And actually, what does perfect mean? So, for example, Hick in his Irenaean Theodicy says, well, creation is good for the purpose of soul making. And so it's not necessarily perfect, but it's good for, the, for a purpose. 
evil and suffering is there for a reason to help us to develop because that's better than us just being like robots. But then if we take God as being a craftsman, then maybe he isn't responsible. Maybe if the texts do show that he created our pre-existing material, he can't be responsible for everything because not everything is down to him. The question again about this serpent or the snake being crafty, if it was crafty, then, and God must have made it, then why would he create it in that way? But then if you argue that those texts shouldn't be taken literally, that they're more mythical, or they might be trying to communicate to us, the idea of the snake just represents the human tendency to fall into temptation, for example. Now, I think something else that you can sort of raise generally is that maybe God didn't even create the world. Maybe actually science can better explain how the world was created. And so therefore you don't fall into any of these issues of how an omnipotent and benevolent God could allow evil and suffering. Now for the final part, we are going to explore the comparison of the Judeo-Christian concept of God with the Aristotle's prime mover. And this is most likely going to be a part A explain question with the command word compare. So compare Aristotle's prime mover with the traditional concept of God or with the biblical God. So the key similarities are they both are the reason why the universe exists. One as the creator and one as the final cause. So remember they both answer why is the universe here? Well because God created it or because the prime mover is the final cause, it's the unmoved mover. They're both explained as perfect, both seen as being unchanging and immaterial. Aquinas' view of God, again, because he's influenced by Aristotle, is this idea that he is a pure act, he doesn't lack anything, and they're both eternal. But the absolute key difference is that the prime mover is unaware of us. He didn't voluntarily create us, it wasn't an act of will from him. He's unaware of us. Whereas the Judeo-Christian concept of God right from the beginning, think about Genesis 1, is all about God created us. He has a relationship with us. He has involvement with us. He is commanding us and talking to us. Whereas the prime mover is completely unaware and he has to be unaware because otherwise he would change. And that's something to really emphasise he is unaware because he needs to be unchanging to be the final cause, to be the final explanation as to why there is this eternal movement. And you might argue that the omni words maybe just don't make sense when applied to Aristotle's prime mover because he's not really kind of omniscient or omnipotent because that suggests more of the idea of a creator, something that's interacting, that is willingly being powerful and has knowledge of creation whereas the prime mover doesn't 